Hey, welcome to Twelve Tone. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. That's the beginning of William Shakespeare's Sonnet 18, probably one of the most famous poems ever written, even if many people only know the first line. But this is a music channel, why are we talking about poetry? Well, poetry and music are actually pretty closely related. Writing a good poem requires a deep understanding of sounds and rhythms. It's like writing a song, except your instrument is language. Plus it helps if you're writing lyrics, but even if you're not, learning poetry makes you a better musician, so today I want to look at one of the most famous traditional forms, the sonnet. The first thing we need to consider here is the meter. This is the underlying pulse that everything is built on top of. In music this is easy because someone is usually playing that pulse, but poetry doesn't have a backing band. If a poet wants rhythm they have to make it themselves, and to do that they turn to the only tool they've got, words. Humans don't naturally speak in monotone. We accent certain parts of the words we're saying, like I just did with parts, words, and say. Poets weaponize this natural tendency, carefully arranging their words so that rhythms appear just by reading them out loud. This is the main difference between poetry and normal writing. A novelist doesn't really care where the emphasis falls, and their prose tend not to have any cohesive structure to them. A poet, on the other hand, cares deeply, and in order to describe the rhythms they create, we've developed a system that we call feet. A foot is a short, repeating pattern of accents, almost like a time signature, but for words. There's lots of different kinds, and we've covered them before, but the important one for our discussion of sonnets is the iamb, which is two syllables with the accent on the second one, like hello, goodbye, or explode. Compare those to the other main two-syllable foot, the trochee, which puts the stress syllable first, like summer, music, or Twelve tone. As a brief aside, when I talk about the importance of meter, I'm talking specifically about Western poetic traditions. Other kinds of poetry, most famously the haiku, get their structure in different ways, but in European poetry, meter is king. Anyway, back to the point. Most English language sonnets are written in what's called iambic pentameter, which sounds scary but actually just means that each line is made up of five iams, like shall I compare thee to a summer's day. Notice that sometimes the foot can stretch across words, so even though summer is a trochee, it combines with a uh, and day to form two iams instead. The other important part of poetry is rhyme, and here sonnets get much more complicated. There's a general agreement that sonnets are 14 lines long, but there's a couple different ways to fill them in. The simplest one is probably the Shakespearean sonnet, which breaks it into three groups of four lines with an extra two at the end. A group of four lines is called a quatrain, and each quatrain has the rhyme scheme ABAB, meaning that the first line rhymes with the third, and the second rhymes with the fourth. If we look back at sonnet 18, we see summer's day rhyming with month of May, and too short a date rhyming with more temperate, at least if you pronounce it like Shakespeare. Would've. The Shakespearean sonnet features three of these quatrains, each with its own set of endings, and then wraps up with a couplet, which is just two lines that rhyme. In sonnet 18, we have so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. This final couplet helps wrap things up and signals the end of the poem. But that's not the only rhyme scheme you might find in a sonnet. One of my favorites is the Spenserian sonnet, which is a lot like the Shakespearean one, but a little more connected. Each of the quatrains still takes the form ABAB, but in addition to that, the first line also rhymes with the last line of the previous quatrain. So if Sonnet 18 were a Spenserian sonnet, the first and third lines of the second quatrain would have to rhyme with date. It's not, though, so they don't. But those are pretty similar, and they're both relative newcomers. The earliest known sonnets weren't English, they were Italian, and these are best exemplified by the poet Petrarch. Petrarchan sonnets have a somewhat more involved form. The first eight lines are combined into one giant rhyme scheme called an octave, which means something completely different to poets than it does to musicians. In a Petrarchan sonnet, the octave always has the rhyme scheme A-B-B-A-A-B-B-A, -A -A -B -B -A, which means means, well, it's kind of like a couplet sandwich. You've got this couplet in the middle, in between two more couplets that also rhyme with each other, all stuck in the middle of one last couplet that rhymes with our first one. If that sounds confusing, don't worry. All that matters here is that the eight lines are all connected. The second half is what's known as the sestet, which covers the remaining six lines. Here, the structure is looser. Sometimes they have two rhymes, like the form C, D, C, D, C, D, and sometimes they have three, like C, D, E, C, D, E. There's no hard and fast rules as to how this part should be arranged, although technically you're not supposed to end with a couplet. People did it anyway though because poets are the original punk rockers. This sudden change in rhyme scheme brings up an important structural element in sonnets, the turn or volta. Sonnets are usually divided into two parts with a sudden thematic shift marked by a change in sections. In sonnet 18, that change occurs between the second and third quatrains. The first part describes the subject as beautiful in the moment, but the line and every fair from fair sometime declines tells us that beauty is impermanent. However, at the start of the third quatrain we get the line but thy eternal summer shall not fade, and from there on out the subject and their beauty become a more 
immortalized by the poem itself. The Volta is most commonly found in the ninth line, especially in Petrarchan sonnets, since that's where we switch to the sestet, but it can go anywhere, at least in theory. You can even leave it out if you're feeling especially punk rock. Sonnets can be an interesting challenge because they force you to think about language in ways you may not be used to. They have enough structure to them to guide you through the process, but there's still enough freedom to allow for a wide range of expression. They can be difficult, but they're great practice, and besides, they're just fun. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you want to help make these videos possible, please consider supporting 12 Tone on Patreon or checking out our store. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and keep on rocking.